give him a hand of praise. I want to share something with you real quick about that from the great preacher of yesteryear named Charles Spurgeon. He said this, you may think as much as you will of Calvary, and you should, and let your tears flow like rivers, but you must ultimately wipe those tears away, for Christ is not in the grave. Amen. We got something to celebrate this morning, church. Let's sing glory to our God, because he is reigning on the throne. Do me a favor, have a seat right now. I want to welcome up some special guests. This is Richard and Denise Taylor, and they got something they want to share with you guys about what they were doing this past week. Um, it was my honor and privilege to be able to go to uh, Acuna, Mexico, with a great group of people. Allie headed everything up, she's amazing. Matt, as well. We have an uh, awesome group of youth. If you didn't know that, they work, they don't camp out on their phones. They, I mean, they do get on their phones, as all of us do, but they work from 7 a.m. till whenever we decide to stop, uh, cooking dinners, leading devotionals. Um, they are our future, and we have a very bright future here at South Park. Um, by going to Mexico, I'm so humbled at what I have and what they don't, but their faith is still buckets and buckets and buckets more than anyone here. They may not have much, but they are appreciative for what they do have. Um, we're going again next year. We already told them what day was it, Wednesday, Thursday. We're going back. Hold us a spot. Um, dirty every day. There was a horrible sandstorm the last day, and I thought we were all going to get blown away. We all had a leg of the uh, tarp or the, uh, the, yeah, 
we all had a, a arm on trying to hold the, the tarp, not tarp, but little pavilion to keep it from blowing away. Um, the family was so appreciative. They made amazing meals. We had homemade tamales. We had fideo. Uh, what else did we have? It was all good. They brought us drinks. Um, uh, Sonia and Celio? Cerulio. Uh, Cerulio got in there with us and did stucco, and he did walls, and he just pitched in, and his wife made amazing meals. Um, it's, we have so much. The house that we built was the size, the whole house was the size of the balcony where the seats are on the left-hand side. The whole house was 200 and something square foot, and there was going to be three rooms. So my bedroom's bigger than their whole house, but they appreciate everything they have, and it's just humbling to be able to go and give and work and how much they appreciate it, and they let you know how much they appreciate it. So it's a privilege to go and to serve, and I, if you have, if you want to go and you keep saying, no, I don't want to do that, we did that last year. Um, do it, step out of your comfort zone, and do something you haven't done before, you will definitely be blessed by what you do, what you see. I didn't know most of the youth. I now all know them first name basis, hugs, um, amazing people. Uh, I don't know if Roz Thurman's in here today, but that lady works circles around everyone. <laughs> She's amazing. So, I mean, we all worked, we all pitched in, we all worked together. There was no fussing, no fighting. Hey, can you help? Sure, no problem. So it was an honor and a privilege to be able to go. You know, I've, I've surrendered. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I rededicated my life to God three years ago. Uh, Allie's been doing this for a long time. Matt's been on us, man, y'all need to go. Y'all need to go. And... I started getting that itch to go, and I told Denise, I said, let's go. So we got with Allie, we paid, our, paid the money and everything, and I was not ready or prepared for what I seen and lived this past week. Uh, it was completely awesome. Uh, our our uh, youth, I call them my kids because I, I love every one of them. They are great. Uh, where one of us struggled, we had people not taking over for them, but encouraging them. Uh, listening to our youth on the way down to Acuna and back, they're not talking about, uh, they're talking about Jesus about the whole time. And I was so very impressed. Uh, now, it cost us the first day. We laid the foundation. The foundation is not just concrete. It is, it is God's foundation for them to bring people into their house and introduce them to Jesus. And Denise told you pretty much everything about the house. Uh, there's um, Pastor Rosalie. Rosalio. I always want to put a T on it, I'm sorry. But he is amazing. He kept patting my stomach and said, hamburger. I said, don't forget hot dogs. <laughs> so, yeah. And he's fluent in English. Yeah, he's fluent in English. Uh, he's got uh, two sons that one plays the, uh, the uh, keyboard, and uh, Handsome plays the drums. That's his other son. His son-in-law, Daniel. Oh, my Lord. This... You know how you get when you bond with somebody. This young man came, came to me, and we were, I mean, we hit it off. Um, we went where he asked me if I've ever done stucco. I told him, no, sir, I've never done stucco. And, I mean, there's a language barrier there, so we're trying to get each other. So he takes me around back to Hyden House, and we get the stucco, and he showed me how to put it on there. Well, I started working on the left-hand side of the house. And he was over about the middle ways. And then he come over and said, oh, no, 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 no. Mucho grande, much. And I went, ah, oh, dumb gringo. 
you know, he, he started laughing. We had a good time with that. And uh, he asked me, yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, man. He asked me, he said, you come back next year. And I said, yes, sir, I promise. I said, yes, sir, we're coming back next year. He asked me, he said, you promise? I said, yes, sir, I promise. And he held up the pinky. Uh, everybody knows, do you, do, do you take a pinky swear? You've got to do it. Well, this is where it's going to get tough on me. That night, they came to the church. I was talking with one of the youth up front. And uh, he came to me, and he gave me this shirt. And he had it in text that he's wore this shirt on several builds. And this is for him, or for me, excuse me, to remember him by. I got a rough exterior, but I got a soft heart now. <laughs> it just, uh, it moved me beyond all measures. The song we just sang, Glory to God, brothers and sisters, it's true. Uh, the people over there are absolutely amazing. You know, like Denise said, they don't have anything, but they roll out the red carpet for you. And it is, uh, it was such a, such a blessing, not only for me, but for Denise. This was our, this was uh, Valentine's Day and our anniversary rolled up in one, and vacation rolled up in one. And Sister Allie, uh, I will give you the down payment on, for next year's trip. So, all right. Everybody, if you haven't had a chance to go, youth, if you haven't had a chance to go, go. Matt is exceptional. Sister Allie is exceptional. Nick is amazing. And what was Nick's wife's name? Uh, Sylvia. Sylvia. Okay. And church, if I could get y'all to do this for us, pray for Nick and <laughs> Sylvia. I'm, I'm getting old. I can't help it. They're trying to have a baby, and she's going through a lot of a uh, lot of uh, surgeries and tests and this and that. But I would really appreciate it if you'll keep those those two in your heart and in your prayers, and keep Costas in your hearts and prayers. And uh, if you get, like I say, I mean I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but if you get the urge to go, don't. Don't uh, let the urge go away. Go. Thank you. I knew I got the right people to talk. <laughs> Usually we save that and do a video and stuff, but I knew on the way home, I was like, we got to get them to share something this Sunday. I think it's only appropriate that we sing about the faithfulness of the Lord after that kind of testimony, right? Would you, if you're able to, would you join me in standing? And let's continue singing to him. Great is thy
seated. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, may that be our heart's cry. May we seek after you and you alone. And Lord, as your word says, when we seek you, you, you let us find you. So Lord, may we seek you and may we find you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, there were some travelers that came into a village and all they were carrying was a big pot with them. And they asked the, those in the village if they could have something to eat. And everybody in the village turned them down. Nothing to eat from anyone. So they took their pot and they set it down by the river. They filled it up with water. Then they found a large stone and they placed it in the pot. And they went and set a fire and started cooking and boiling the water with the stone in it. And after a little while, one of the villagers came by the road and looked and said, what are you doing? I said, well, we're making stone soup. It's almost ready. It's going to taste amazing, but it's just, it's missing a garnish. And so the villager said, well, I've got some carrots. And so he came and he brought some carrots and they cut them up into the soup. And then along came another villager and the same story happens again. He said, oh, I have some seasonings that will help your soup and added that to the soup. And then along came villager after villager till there was this amazing, hearty, wonderful pot of soup. And everybody gathered around and enjoyed that soup with one another. But when it comes to God, we don't have to make stone soup. We don't have to trick, connive, manipulate God into giving us what we need. He graciously, generously wants to give us everything that we need in life. So when we come to Matthew chapter 7, we find that Jesus continues in this Sermon on the Mount, and he teaches us about prayer. As he does in verse 7, he begins by saying, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. The one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Uh, so Jesus returns to talking about prayer. We got some teaching about prayer a little bit earlier in this sermon. We have the Lord's Prayer, but here Jesus begins to teach us more about prayer. A prayer that comes to God, comes to God for anything. Now, for those uh, of the Jewish faith, they saw this kind of prayer that we can talk to God intimately, closely, come to God with anything in our lives. They saw this reserved for those who were like super holy. That was for the Abrahams, the Moseses, the Elijahs. Those were the ones who could come to God like that. And it's those that we put on the pedestal that can go to our Heavenly Father. But the good news for us is that when Jesus died on the cross, he took our sins upon him. The, the thing that separated us from God, he took care of. And so when Jesus died on the cross, what happens as he breathes his last? Uh, the curtain that separated the holy of holies from the holy place, that, that separated the place where God was believed to dwell, that curtain tore in two from top to bottom. Uh, it symbolically and literally opened the way back up 
to God. We can now come to God. Why? Because Jesus has died on the cross. He has paid the price for our sins. The sins that actually kept us from God are now taken care of. And so we have nothing that hinders us, keeps us from coming into God's presence anymore. We are allowed to, we are able to pray. Uh, now, I would say in the Christian life, prayer is commonplace, isn't it? It's, it's a privilege that we get to pray, but we all know we need to pray. This isn't going to be an earth-shattering sermon this morning. But what we do need to remember to do is to take time to come to the Lord, the one who can shake the earth when we come to him in prayer. So the biggest question is, are we praying? Are we actually coming to God? We know we need to do it. Are we actually doing it? So as Jesus begins to talk about prayer, he says, first off, ask and it will be given to you. My mom has a motto, and she lives by it. She's lived by it my whole life. It never hurts to ask. What's the worst they could do? Say no. And she does that. And it has come in handy for her in her life. Uh, she has asked for all sorts of things. She gets the best deals at places. You know all those places that say you can't combine offers? Like, you know, only one coupon? Well, not for my mom. Uh, because she asks, and she, she gets, I think they pay her to buy clothes sometimes. Uh, it, it's ridiculous. And so sometimes embarrassing, right? But she is not afraid to ask. And that's what God's telling us here. That's what Jesus is telling us. We should come to the Father that way. We should not be afraid to ask. We should come as a child to a parent. We should come as a creation to our creator. We should come to a God who desperately wants to answer our prayers and ask him anything. Ask him everything. So do we come to God and ask? And so sometimes we can come to God and we can ask for prayer requests, and we'll get to those in just a minute. That is definitely part of what Jesus is asking here. Uh, but do we come and ask God the hard questions sometimes, the difficult questions, the why questions? Why did this happen? Why are you allowing this to go on in the world? Do we ask God those questions? Are we a little bit uncomfortable with those questions. You see, the, those questions of God, what is happening? Why, why is this going on? Why is there evil in the world? The hard questions in life, uh, those questions come when we have relationship with God, when we've built a deep relationship with God. Uh, those aren't the first questions you ask of somebody, right? So if somebody came up to you and introduced themselves, hi, my name is John, you say, oh, well, nice to meet you, John. What do we do with all the suffering and the violence in this world around us? Anybody greet somebody that way? Is that the first conversation? You, no, that's not the first conversation you have with somebody. When we get to know somebody, then we're able to have those deeper, harder conversations. Once we have a relationship, they can handle it. So the point here is we need to be able to have a relationship with God where we spend enough time with him that when the difficult times come and the difficult times will come, that the relationship's ready for those questions. That, that instead of running from God in difficult times, we run to God in difficult times. And then we are able to ask him those questions of why and we are ready to hear his answers as well, because ask and you shall receive. God does have answers to our difficult questions. The psalmists, uh, all through the psalmists, I could have probably picked any number of them this morning. Uh, they love to ask God difficult questions. So we get to Psalm chapter 13 this morning, and we see just one example of these hard questions that the psalmist asks. In this case, it's David. In Psalm chapter 13, we read, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? And we don't know exactly when in David's life he wrote this psalm, but we can imagine the times in David's life where he must have felt this way. 
Saul is coming murderously after him. His own son, later in his life, comes and takes his throne and sends his father running in that same wilderness as well. David experienced those coming after him. So he brings these questions, these prayers to God. Verse 3, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice, because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me. You'll notice there, right before verse 5, there's a shift, isn't there? David goes from asking these questions of God to seeing God's response, to seeing God's faithfulness, to seeing that God is with him even in these difficult times. That he does not have to go through it alone as he felt at the beginning, but that God is truly with him, with his steadfast love and his salvation and his presence. In the end, when we come to God with our questions, he, he gives us answers. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Uh, now, this also goes with what we would typically think of as intercession. The, the things where we ask God for things for other people. We ask God for things for ourselves. Uh, we come to God with our prayers, with our requests. And, and that is definitely a part of prayer. Uh, now, when we talked about the Lord's Prayer, we said, you know, that wasn't in the Lord's Prayer. But here, when Jesus comes back to prayer, he definitely asks us to ask him for things. He wants us to come to him. And now, the problem is, sometimes we treat this like, like a cosmic blank check. I ask God for anything I want, and he is obligated to give it to me. It's the genie in the lamp. I got my three wishes. Whatever I wish for, God's going to give me. Is that how it works? I want a bigger house. I want a better car. I want a better paying job. Is that what God has to give us? Well, no. <laughs> That's not what's going on here, is it? Uh, James helps us out with this. James chapter 4, verse 2. Uh, James talks a little bit about why we don't get what we want in prayer. You desire and you do not have so you murder. You covet, and you cannot obtain. So you fight, and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Uh, so the first problem that James... Oh, well, there's a lot of problems that James is addressing here. We can't get to all of them. But the first one is they're not asking. So if we don't ask God for something, uh, we come and we see God's, God's not going to answer the prayers we don't pray. But then here's the bigger problem. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So the second part's probably the more important part here. We ask and we don't receive because we ask with the wrong motive. We ask selfishly for what I want and for what's for my passion in this world. Instead, what does God desire for us to come to him? What's the attitude that we need to come to God in prayer? Not for my own passions and for my own selfishness. But we should come to God in prayer seeking what he desires and what he wants and what his passion is in this world. And if we ask in keeping with what God desires, we will find that God graciously and gladly answers those prayers. And it goes with what Jesus really says next in this verse, doesn't it? Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. So we need to ask, but we need to be asking in a way that is also seeking. Now, when we seek after God, it's the easiest game of hide-and-go-seek ever. My kids uh, used to do this quite a bit. Uh, they would love to play hide-and-go-seek. And they haven't done it as much lately, but uh, particularly they love to play the game hide-and-go-seek when I came home from work. And they didn't wait for me to come in the door, give me a hug, and Daddy, we're so glad you're home. No, many times when I came home from work, whew, they're gone. I'm like, Lori, where are the kids? 
uh, and then we would have this fun conversation. Well, did you forget to get them at church today? Was, it my, was I supposed to bring them home from church? Did you bring them home from church? Or school, did you forget to pick them up? Oh, no, you're supposed to pick them up from school. And we would have this fun conversation uh, loud enough for our kids to hear it. Uh, and most of the time, I would hear a little bit of giggling, which would give me a clue as to where my young kids were hiding in the house. Uh, but whatever the case was, it wasn't usually hard to find them. They often hid in the same places. Now this week, they didn't know what I was preaching about, but they must have known I needed a sermon illustration. Because my oldest, David, decided to play hide-and-go-seek when I came home from work. And, and again, they haven't done this in so long that all the girls were like giddy with excitement. They were so like thrilled that David was hiding. They thought he had a great hiding place. And it might have been a great hiding place, except for they were so excited about it that it was a mixture of playing hot and cold and follow the leader to get to his room where he was hiding. And he was in, you know those beanbag chair things, right? So he emptied all the beanbag part of it out. Just kidding. Um, we, we have some that like you stuff with stuffed animals instead of the beanbag stuff, and the animals make them soft. And so he got all the stuffed animals out of them, and he had gotten inside of it. Thankfully, he didn't zip himself up. Claustrophobia would not have been good. Um, but it was just sitting in the middle of his floor. And that's not where it usually lives. So I kind of tripped over it, gently laid down on top of it, and found David. Uh, and that was a fun game of hide-and-go-seek. Not a very hard game of hide-and-go-seek. But when it comes to God, it's even easier than that. Because he wants us to find him. He's not hiding anywhere. He's just saying, come to me. Seek after me. We're reminded of the parable he teaches just a couple chapters over in chapter 13. It says the kingdom of heaven is like a man who's walking through a field and he finds a treasure. When he finds it, he buries it. Then he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field in great joy. It's like a merchant who is buying pearls and when he finds one of greatest value. He goes and he sells all that he has and he buys that pearl. We see that the kingdom of heaven is something we seek after. It's something we desire. It's something we should want. But it's not a one-time thing. We've found it. We have it. We're good to go now. And now. What image does Jesus give us for what it means to truly believe in him? What's the invitation that he gives his disciples? The invitation that Jesus gives his disciples is come Follow me. It's a continual seeking. It's a continual following. It's a continual going after God. Well, we saw it earlier in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. What does he say? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what we are to do in this life. That's how we are to live our life. We are to seek God and to seek God first. Not just one time till we find him, but continually throughout our lives we seek God. And when we seek him, we will find him. And so sometimes we're like, well, what's God doing? What does God want? How can I see and know God? Well, just look for him. He is easy to find. And so if we spend our time in his word, if we spend our time seeking after him, if we spend our time praying and getting to know God more, you know what? When we start looking around this world, we'll see him. We'll see how he's at work in our lives. We'll see how he's at work in others' lives. We'll see what he's revealing to us through his word. And we will be able easily to find our God. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. And then knock and it will be opened to you. When we knock on a door, I think knocking is a game of perseverance. Uh, who will outlast the knock? Uh, and particularly if it's a salesman coming to your door, it is that game of perseverance, right? Is he going to stay there longer, or am I going to not open the door longer? Who's going to win this game? But I don't know about you, but have you ever considered knocking etiquette? Like, is there, I don't know if there is etiquette, I should have probably looked it up this week, but I have my own knocking etiquette, all right? It goes like this. First, I come to the door, and I'll ring the doorbell. If I don't hear the doorbell ring in your house, then I'm going to wait like five seconds-ish, I'm going to give you three knocks on the door, okay? And then I'm going to sit there, and I'm going to wait. 
depending on who you are and how fast I think you can move, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. So, yeah, I mean, that's just giving you my thought process here. 30 seconds to a minute is about what you have, all right? And then I'm going to knock again. Now, if you have a dog that's barking, then that supersedes the second knock because the dog is alerting you of my presence, so I don't need to alert you of my presence again, right? Anybody else play this game when you're standing at the door, or am I just weird? Um, all right, I'm just weird. But that's, that's how it goes. Now, at this point, I, that's going to happen every time I come to a door, right? Until you get there, that's the thought process that goes on in my mind. But now I've got to wonder, how long do I keep knocking? I mean, I can knock one more time, but then if I knock another time after that, I mean, when does this start becoming something that's rude? When does this start becoming something odd? When do I just say, you know what, they're probably not home or they don't really want to see me? When do I give up? Knocking. Knocking is a game of perseverance. How long will I stay there and knock? And really what it comes down to for me is, like, how sure am I that you're really home? And how much do I really need to see you right at this very moment? And that will depend on how long I actually stay knocking at your door. So when we come to this part of the passage... That's really what's going on. It's about perseverance. Do we continue to come to God in perseverance? Do do we give up easily, or do we keep on asking and keep on seeking? Luke, in chapter 11, records the same teaching from Jesus. But he includes a parable that happens right at the beginning of this teaching. And what that parable says is, who of you, if you have a friend, will you not go to him at midnight and knock on his door and ask him for three loaves of bread because you have another friend that came in town late at night? And that friend is going to be like, hey, the door's already shut for the night. The kids are in bed. I'm not going to give up and give you bread. But even though he's not going to give you bread because he's your friend, because of your persistence, he will get up and give you bread. And then that's when in Luke's gospel we find, Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock, and the door will be opened to you. And so there is a perseverance that comes in our prayer. Do we continually come to God or do we give up easily? Is this a regular part of our lives or is this something we do occasionally, once in a while, and then forget about it. God wants us to come to him. He wants us to come to him over and over again. He doesn't want us to give up, but to persist in prayer. And the good thing is, is that God wants to give us good things. Uh, He wants us to come to him in prayer, and he wants to answer our prayers. He doesn't want to make this a frustrating experience, but a joyful experience for us. Which is what we get in the next part of this passage, isn't it? Because once we come to God and we seek Him and we ask of Him and we knock on the door, we find that He answers those prayers and then He gives us this parable, doesn't He? Who of you, when your son asks for bread, gives him a rock? Or when he asks for fish, gives him a snake. Parents, you're not going to do that, are you? You're not going to serve your kids rocks for dinner. Now, your siblings might do it to you, but your parents aren't going to do it to you. Uh, Actually, I was eating dinner with my older brother. Uh, We were in the same foreign country as last week's sermon, I think probably even the same night. Um, He lived overseas for a while. I was visiting him. And we were eating dinner at this restaurant, right? And I think it was pizza, and I I chomped down on this bite of pizza, and he's like, oh, did you get a rock? I was like, yeah. He said, yeah, you got to be careful. Sometimes there's rocks in your food here. I was like, well, that would have been helpful to know about 30 seconds ago. He's like, you got to chew softly here. I was like, really? There's rocks in your food here. And like, that's not a normal thing, by the way. Um, there's a funny joke. We were in Iraq. Iraq. Uh, anyway, I usually don't say where my older brother was living. Sorry. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have put that online. Um, but, uh, you know, there was a rock in my food. I was like, 
this is not normal. This is not what we should have in our food. This is not what we should have to worry about here. But what Jesus is saying is, of course not. No, we want good things for our kids. So my kids this week were... We were making uh, gardens for our backyard. I was putting together kind of a border for the gardens to kind of contain the dirt a little bit. And so they collected all the sawdust for my saw as I was cutting the lumber to put together these boxes for our garden. And then they took that sawdust and they mixed it with water while we were working. And they made sawdust soup. Mmm. Right? And they worked hard on that all afternoon. They worked hard on this sawdust soup. But when it came time for dinner, do you know what they ate? They ate what Lori prepared. Why? Because she wants us to eat good food. Uh, And her foods are going to be a whole lot better than sawdust soup. It's going to taste good to us. It's going to be what we need in life. And the good thing about God is that that's what he wants for us. He wants what's best for us. He wants to give us the fruits and the vegetables and the meat that we really need to eat. He's not going to give us rocks and snakes. The problem comes, though, is that sometimes we want rocks and snakes, don't we? Because sometimes rocks look good to us. I mean, sometimes rocks look like a piece of bread or a baked potato. And sometimes we think that that's what we really want. And sometimes snakes look good to us. They, maybe they look like fish, but if you take a bite of it, it's not going to be very yummy. It's going to be stringy. It's not going to taste good. And apparently it has a lot of parasites and worms. I wouldn't recommend eating snake as a regular part of your diet. But sometimes that's what we want. We want what is not what's best for us. And everybody else around can see that's not what's best for us, but we want it anyway. And we come to God and we ask and we ask and we ask for rocks and snakes. And then we get mad because God doesn't give us rocks and snakes, right? But God doesn't promise us to give us everything we want. And I don't give my kids everything they want. Instead, God promises us to give us what we really need. He gives us what's good for us. So this week, uh, we've been listening to a lot more country music. Actually, over the last few weeks, we've been listening to a lot more country music in our car. I don't know if you all know this, but there's a rodeo going on in Houston. And so when rodeo's happening, country music just starts to uh, come in our car a little more often. And so I heard a song that I haven't heard in a long time come across the radio. Uh, he happens to be singing tonight at the rodeo. If you've got extra tickets, I wouldn't mind taking Lori. Um, the song goes like this. All my... Ex- Just kidding. Um, <laughs> if you're in Gilbert Sunday School class. Uh, no, it goes like this. Just the other night at a hometown football game, my wife and I ran into an old high school flame. As I introduced them, the past came back to me. I couldn't help but think of the way things used to be. She was the one I thought I wanted for all times. And each night I'd spent praying that God would make her mine. Anybody ever been there? I'm just, confession's good for this. All right. And, uh, and if he'd only grant me this wish, I wish back then, I'd never ask for anything again. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Remember when we're talking to the man upstairs that just because he doesn't answer doesn't mean he doesn't care. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Uh, Garth Brooks is a theologian. I didn't know it. Um, But it's a good point, isn't it? Oh, it's it's Garth Brooks. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. It's Garth. Yeah. Is George there tonight? Wait. Wait, wait. Garth Brooks is here. George Strait's tonight. All right, I'll listen to any of them, honestly. Uh, sorry, this is Garth. That's George. Um, excuse, excuse me. <laughs> They're country legends. I'm sorry. They start with G's. Um, all right, fine. Um, <laughs> I'm still, uh, yeah, really, the sermon illustration is there for tickets tonight, so, you know, just, just kidding. Um, <laughs> 
The real point, <laughs> what we're actually trying to get to, is the fact that some of the greatest gifts God has to us is unanswered prayers. Sometimes we pray for the things we don't need. But sometimes the answer to that prayer that we really need in life is no. Because sometimes we ask for the wrong things, and that's okay. It's okay to ask God for the wrong thing. The thing is we actually just need to listen to his answer to us. When God doesn't answer a prayer the way we expect him to, doesn't mean he's not answering the prayer. Right? So sometimes we think that God's only answering our prayers when he gives us what we asked for. But God answers our prayers by giving us what we need. And sometimes an answer is no. Because God wants what is good for us. And so the question is, when we pray, do we trust that God's good really is good? Do we, do we trust that what he wants really is best? And his best is best. Or do we really hold on to our own good and our own best and what we want in this world? And so when we pray, we need to remember that God wants to give us the things that are best for us. We get back to James chapter 1. And we find this truth. Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God gives us good things. And he's not going to give us anything that is not good. He wants what is best for us. And so we have a God who wants us to come to him who wants us to pray to him, who wants to give us good things in this world, the question is, are we going to seek him? And in Luke's rendition of this teaching, he gets to the ultimate good for us. He says that at the very end, what you will receive is the Holy Spirit. You will receive God with you, God walking through the life with you. He will be alongside you each step along the way. That's the ultimate answer to our prayer, is God is with us. The other thing we find about these good things in this prayer is that there's an agricultural image going on here. It's a good, high-quality crop. And when you have a good crop, if you hopefully uh, we have a garden going, I'm praying that it will turn out well, and I hope that I will have an overabundance of peppers and tomatoes and other things. And what am I going to do when I have that overabundance of peppers and tomatoes and other things? I give them away, right? I want to share those with others. And so we get to what I think rightly fits at the end of this part of the passage, a verse that says, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. It's the golden rule. It's not unique to Jesus, honestly. The variations of this have existed uh, at various times in history, even predating Jesus. And sometimes it's in the negative, right? Don't do things to others that you don't want them to do to you. Just don't be mean. It would be that version of it. And in this case, it's do good things. Look for the things that you like done to you and do them for others. But Jesus has been setting us up for this all along, hasn't he? And so we find that we are to be merciful to others. And if we are merciful to others, then we will receive mercy ourselves. If we have been forgiven by God, then we should be forgiving people. And then right here in this passage about prayer, we find that if God is a generous God being kind and answering our prayers and petitions and desires, we should in turn be generous people to others as well. I mean, this golden rule starts off with the word, so. Because of all of that, then we are to treat others this way. And so given this context, what we should hear when we hear the golden rule is not only do unto others as you would have them do to you, but we should also hear God has been gracious and kind and generous and kind to you, and if you've appreciated the way God has treated you, then you should treat others in that way. And so we should not only treat others the way we want to be treated, but we should treat others the way God has treated us. Do we treat others that way? Are we forgiving and gracious and generous 
Do we want what is ultimately good for them? Is that our mindset to the people around us? If so, I think it will change our actions and our interactions with others. I think when it comes down to it this morning, uh, I probably haven't said anything too earth-shattering. Something you haven't heard probably a hundred times before. We, we know that God wants us to know him. We, we know that God wants us to come to him and ask things from him and seek after him. Well, we know that it should change the way we treat the people around us. The, the hard thing about this morning is will we do it? Will we go this week and will we spend more time in prayer? Will we spend more time with God? Will we truly seek his will? And when he shows us what he wants, will we actually do it? That's the hard part. Uh, the part I did this morning was pretty easy, minus the Garth Brooks, George Strait thing. Um, but the hard thing is living this out. Uh, but I think when we do it, we find the great joy that comes in seeking after God. And we find the more we do it, not only the easier it is, but the more we want to do it. The more we want to seek after God, the more we want to ask of Him, the more we want to persevere in prayer. So this week, my challenge to you is go and pray. Go spend time with the Lord. And don't serve stones at your next dinner party. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you uh, that you do want to talk to us. That you wanted us to know you so much you sent Jesus to die on the cross and raise it again so that we could have a way back to you. So that the barrier, the thing that was standing in the way of this relationship was taken away. So now, because of our faith in you, we're able to come before you. And so, Lord, uh, let's, let's not just take that for granted. Let us appreciate that. Lord, I pray that you will collectively give us the desire to talk to you more. And the desire to seek after you. And, and Lord, may what you said in this passage be true. May we, in return, hear from you. May, may we see you more. May we know you more. And may that change the way we treat the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for worship this morning at South Park Baptist Church. We're thankful you joined us online today. If you need to respond in any way uh, to this service, please email me at chad at southparkchurch.net. You can call the church office, 281-331-3902. So if you need to know more about what it means to believe in Jesus and to seek after him and to follow him, I'd love to talk to you about that. If you need somebody to pray with, uh, or if you're looking for a church to become a part of, uh, please give us a call. One quick announcement this week. This coming Saturday, there's going to be a community-wide fundraiser called Cookies for Kylie. Uh, it's going to support Kylie Taylor, who was in uh, a bad accident uh, a couple months ago. And that will be in uh, South Park's parking lot uh, on Saturday morning from 9 o'clock to noon. Uh, we'll have all kinds of baked goods, or if you just want to donate uh, to those medical expenses, you can do that at that time. If you'd like to donate cookies or any other kind of baked good, uh, you can bring those at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning, or you can uh, contact uh, Carrie Flores, Jackie Holting, or Jen Robinson, and they'll uh, collect those items from you as well. Uh, that cookies for Kylie will also go on Sunday afternoon right after church. Uh, so you can go, leave church on Sunday morning and be able to get some of those as well. Now as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Praise the Son, praise the Spirit.